Black market? Mm -hmm. Just Facebook? Yeah. I mean, we didn't even tell people it was going to YouTube, right? So we don't have to worry. And then we're going to have to sign into YouTube and see if that works, and that's going to take a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you want, no, 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 oh, no, 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 what should I do? Oh, it's the wrong one. It's going to my other page, right? Oh, can I stop it? Uh, cancel. Publish on Facebook Live, right? Mm -hmm. And then we go to where we want it. We want it on a group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is. Sorry. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me okay, Lynn? I can hear you. I can't see you. Right. Uh, hold on just a second. I'm getting on Facebook Live, so I'm pushing buttons right now. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is, oh, let's see. Um, hold on just a second. Okay. Oh, hold on just a second. Okay, tech stuff. It's not my favorite. There we go. Now, where's my camera? There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, good. Now, yay. Okay, I think I can sit down now. Let's see if I can sit down. Oh, yeah, I can sit down. Okay. Thanks, sweetie. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I kept telling her, don't leave me. Don't leave me. <laughs> Stay with me till I'm on this thing. She's a lot better with, uh, with Easy Webinar than I am. She's, she studied it a lot better than I did. Okay, so here we are. Yay, people are on too. We have people joining us. Okay, yep, the numbers are going up. We have 81 so far here. Plus, we're broadcasting live to Facebook. And I decided to try to use these um, this headset because Liz mentioned that you were having trouble during the test. You were having trouble hearing her. So I thought maybe it might, yeah. the sound might be a little better with the headset. Uh, I'm hoping. Yeah. Oh, oh, good. Good deal. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, Gigi, if you're here, if you're here, can you hear us? You don't need to go to the live uh, to the live Facebook Live if you're here. Hi from South Africa. Wow, we got people from all over the world. That's great. Hi, Jimmy. Good to see you. Okay, wonderful. People say they're hearing us. Hi, Anne. Hi, oh Anne, how are you doing? Anne Tataro's here. Hey, John. Oh, hi from Scotland, Martin. Hey, Ellen DiNucci, I haven't seen you in years. <laughs> oh, hey, Ron from Puget Sound. Good to, good to see you. I was born in Washington. <laughs> okay, Mark, are you still not seeing a video? Because I think everyone else can see us. So it might you might have to sign out and sign back in. Hi, hi Diane. Good to see you. Hi, Jana from the UK. Oh, Bodega Bay, California. Wow. Hey, Christy from Oregon. Carrie in North Carolina. Carrie, it's good to see you. What's that, Lynn? <laughs> is that your beautiful, is, is that what I, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was at a truck stop when we were going to Phoenix and someone had taken a gold handled uh, cane and it was, it's very heavy. And they had these little cheap $10 walking sticks. Yeah. I guess they had got, wanted to get rid of that heavy one. So they dropped it into there, took one of the $10 ones. I came by and I thought, I like that. So I paid ten dollars for it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a deal, huh? <laughs> Score. <laughs> That's like <laughs> hey from New Mexico, Sabrina, fellow New Mexican. Lynn and I are in New Mexico. Yeah. Uh Houston, San Francisco, Berkeley. Oh gosh, you guys. I uh Steve, I didn't know you were in San Francisco. Um, gosh, that's a uh, is, is are the fires getting better, I hope. 
I hope they're getting better. I know the sky here is much clearer today. Is it clear down in Alamogordo? A little bit, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It's really cleared up here. Uh, it's, I mean, we went to Albuquerque the other day. You couldn't even see the mountains around the around Albuquerque, and that's how bad it was. But um, but today, I, I went just went for a walk this morning, and it was gorgeous and really clear. Oh, good, Ellen. Hi, Ellen. I forgot that you were in the Bay Area. Wow. So it's so great to see everybody. Welcome, welcome. We are recording. And hey, hi from Poland, Anna. Hi, Lori. Good to see you. Good. Um, yeah, so here we are. And we are uh, really happy to be back doing webinars again. There was a big break in our webinars as I was trying to sort out things with Zoom. And um, actually, Zoom is finally kind of recovering from the tidal wave that they experienced with the pandemic. Um, and I find, you know, I had been writing them and writing them and writing them and writing them about my issue with their whole webinar platform. And I would get these little automated letters back, uh, just like little computer letters, you know, that didn't have a human behind them. And I would write these answers to the, <laughs> to the automated thing saying, no, it's not resolved, blah, blah, blah. And I finally, all of a sudden, three days ago, I got let, uh, four letters from real humans from Zoom apologizing. Um, anyway, they refunded my money, but I was already signed up by that time with Easy Webinar. So we're giving this a, a shot to see if Easy Webinar is going to work. Uh, you're a little bit blurry, Lynn. For some reason, you're. I'm. Um, I, I, are we all blurry? Is everybody seeing us as blurry, or uh, are, can you all see us clearly? I'm getting a very sharp picture on both of us. Oh, good. Okay, it's probably on my end then. I see me sharply, but I don't see you. But we've been having problems with the internet here as well. <laughs> technology uh, is, <laughs> it's technology. Oh, it says for Lynn Buchanan about the Romanian version of the book, The Seven Cents. I have it, but I don't know where to send it to you. Oh, ah. Okay. Um, and that was... Yeah. That's Demi. Demi, do you want me, I can send, do you want me to give it to her? Because she's my student. I could send it to her if you want. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Dimi, I'll I'll get it to you. I'll get you to where you can send it. I'll give you the address. <laughs> that way we're not posting your address like out to millions of people. <laughs> I've been trying to get these things from Simon and Schuster. They won't send them. Yeah. Oh, oh great. Well, that's good. Hey Donna, I'm so glad to see you. Um she says, I see you beautifully and sound is good. Clear air here in Marcola, Oregon. That's wonderful. Donna uh, is, is practically a relative. You're, you're almost like a sister, right, Donna? Uh, because Donna and her siblings were raised with Jim and his siblings. And their fathers were best friends from the time they were eight years old. So it's almost like we're related. Um, okay. Oh, Ron says, Lori's clear, but Lynn's a bit blurry. Bandwidth issues, I think. Okay. Um, and hi, Lori, I'm struggling to see on this webinar. Okay. She, uh, Ed Wild is here. He says, Lynn's camera is wavy, but fine. Hey, Ed. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yeah, a little wavy. Okay. Um, okay. I can hear it, Lynn really, really well. Um, Malcolm says, Lynn's voice is a little fainter than yours, maybe further from the mic. Okay. 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 So, Everybody, it's really, really good. Um, I'm really wonderful. I'm really happy that we're back. And folks, if you want, you can start asking questions. I believe Liz is in the other room. Uh, hey, Liz, if you're there, can you type? Can you say hi? Um, I think she's, I hope she's there. <laughs> Let's see if she's there. Anyway, if she's there, what uh, she was going to do Um uh, you should be able to see Nicole. You should you should be able to see both of us. Um, some people are saying they can't see us. I don't know why. You can't see the chat. Oh, you can't see the. Oh, you have to open up the chat. There's probably a button, Nicole, that you can open up the up the chat. Oh, she says she can see us. She just can't see the chat. Okay, go ahead and uh, put a push a button. Look for a button that says chat, and it should open up. Um, I hope. Okay, so I'm just gonna make I'm gonna make sure that um, we get qu Facebook questions. Okay, so Elizabeth is going to be passing us any questions that are coming through from Facebook since I don't have Facebook open here, and that way we don't have to try to be watching Facebook and watching this at the same. There she is. 
Um, okay, so Liz is there. She said, uh, she says, I, I won't have my camera on as I'm a moderator and not as cool. <laughs> You're just as cool, Liz, Elizabeth. We love you. <laughs> okay, here's a question to Lynn. Lynn, how, how do you visualize your aura and chakras for best accuracy? That was the first question to come through. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. <laughs> he sees that. I don't. I have only seen auras one time in my life that I know of, and that was around Pam Coronado. Mm. And, um, otherwise, I have just wondered if auras are people's imagination because I've never been able to see them. So, um, um, I have seen auras. Um, hey, Tom, Bank, good to see you. I remember you from The Power of Eight. Um, I have seen auras. In fact, um, I've actually been able to read auras, but I don't connect auras at all with remote viewing. Um, to me, they're two totally separate things. My CRV practice is my CRV practice, and I haven't actually done anything with auras since probably 2013 or so, maybe even 2012. It's been a long, long time since I, and, and it's, a, it's a thing that I kind of like either turn on or keep turned off. And, uh, and I don't ever mix them because they're, they're just, it's almost like, um, like a screwdriver and a hammer. They have different functions for me and I just don't mix them. I don't really have a reason to. Um, so when we're getting ready to do controlled remote viewing, different viewers have different ways that they prepare for that. Um, and so I guess if a viewer, if a particular viewer really felt like, hey, I do better viewing if I align chakras and align my auras, I guess a viewer would do that. But Lynn and I tend to not kind of lean that direction. So I never worry about aligning chakras or auras and Lynn doesn't either. But Lynn, would you like to share what you do when you're when you have a, a remote viewing session or something that you're going to prepare to do with CR, a CRV session? How do you prepare? Um, I have kept data, and uh, I have found that preparing in certain ways makes me feel like I have a really good session, and they're total garbage. And um, so after keeping data and trying just about everything, what I have found is that I will clean the desk, go out, clean the car, mow the lawn, do the session, do something else, do something else, do some, and just whap, 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 like that. No preparation, whatever. I feel like I'm totally lost, and my sessions come up better. <laughs> <laughs> my, my seat fell down, sorry. Um, yeah, that... You know, I, people find I, different ways. Everybody has a different way. I know one of my students, in order to get himself cleared, get his mind cleared of everything else, goes out and stacks rocks, balancing rocks, you know. Mm -hmm. Different people will listen to hemisync tapes. Uh, you, you have to find out what works best for you. The whole idea is you've got to get your mind off everything else. For me, cleaning the desk, cleaning the car out and things like that gets my mind off everything else. I do the session and I'm finished like that. Okay. Well, um, I find that if I, if I go like for a walk outside for a few minutes, even just five minutes, it really helps. And then when I come in, I actually say a little prayer out loud and just kind of ask that whatever I get while I'm in this session will be accurate and what the customer most needs from me or who, you know, whoever the information is for. Um, that's kind of how I tend to find that this is sort of my little ritual that I do. And it's usually really fast. It's not something that takes hours or anything. Um, yeah, let's see here. Uh, let me go back real quickly and just make sure we haven't missed anything way up here. Um, okay. We're talking about connections, connections. Um, Malcolm asked about, uh, children and, uh, people pre 20 years learning CRV and, um, uh, I have done that uh, with success, by the way. Uh, children do seem to have a much easier time, better time. Uh, the thing is, our country is so litigious <laughs> that uh, anytime I have anyone under 18, 
I require their parents' approval and for their parents to be there so that, you know, 40 years later, when they have a car wreck, all of a sudden it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've also, in my classes, I think I've had um, a few 11 and 12 year olds, about the youngest uh, in my classes that were not my children. And then of course, my children all got some indoctrination because I think my youngest was four or five when I first started studying with you, Lynn, as I recall. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Diane is asking about Mars, uh, asking if there's any live beings, not us currently underground on Mars. I don't know, Diane, but I have done several sessions on Mars. Mel Riley also did some sessions on Mars. Lynn, have you done some sessions on Mars? I've done many, uh, but they were all in the past. And uh, I did find, um, and I did one, this was back in the mid 80s, I think, and found some live beings there underground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, that was when you were in your 20s, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And Diane, also, if you're interested in Mars, um, there is a blog on my website called 18 Years of Excitement. Um, and it and it, it talks about the session that I did on Mars. It kind of has some details on that. Um, and then let's see, I had missed that question before. And then we have: um, Are you able to uh, resolve any unanswered questions about human history and the origin of humans? Well, yeah. However, uh, then you know uh, the way you have to do it is you have to keep data and you will hear me, I'm a data freak, <clears throat> uh, see how well you are and how accurate you are, how good a track record you have on provable uh, targets. Then if you do an unprovable target, you know, with no historical data to back it up and all that, then if you do that, you have a dependability rating for your accuracy, but you still don't have proof. Okay, yeah, that's very good. And then Renee says, Lynn, could you explain the danger of learning remote viewing and opening up access to your unconscious? Well, yeah, there are some things in your unconscious you may not want to face. And, uh, uh, you know, they say you are what you are in the dark. Uh, but also, uh, to thine own self be true, and uh, you'll find that if you make friends with yourself, it's the best friend you'll ever have, the most pro protective friend you've ever had, and your subconscious is a hundred times smarter than you are and a thousand times faster than you are, so its protection is really good. But... Uh, yeah, but in the process of becoming friends with your own subconscious mind, uh, you're going to uncover some things that you may not want to admit about yourself. I know one of the uh, most, sometimes uh, one of the most disappointing targets you can get is when somebody blind targets you against yourself and you don't know that the person you're viewing is yourself and you get very accurate <laughs> and you get very detailed uh, and you all of a sudden see your feedback and you say, well, that's not what I want to be. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. And also uh, years, years ago, I'll have to ask Liz to try to look for it for me. I made a video on YouTube. I, I don't see it on my channel right now, but it's called is remote viewing dangerous. Um, and I think that really a lot of people worry that it's dangerous that you might, you know, I, I mean, some people worry, like, could I get demon possessed or, you know, could I, could I pick something up, you know, or have some things. We, we do have a detox process to make sure that after we do remote viewing, we detox from anything we might have picked up on, you know, accessing things subconsciously. But also, I think that's another really good argument for having good training. Lynn and I are both trainers and you want to definitely have good training because a lot of times if you're just out there experimenting, 
I think that can be dangerous to some oh, extent. Oh, yeah, very. And uh, the Ingo Swan method has um, in the training, not just detox afterwards, but in the training itself, it has uh, protection methods and tools built into the training. So you like when you're going to do people. First of all, you learn to protect yourself from those people, and then you learn how to view them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because like in medical apps, uh, you can get sick if you don't do it right. Mm -hmm. And um, if that's a physical illness, you can get physically ill. What if it's a mental illness? You can pick that up too. An emotional or a spiritual illness, you can pick up those. And uh, so in the medical apps, the first almost half of the medical apps course is teaching you to protect yourself. Then we teach you how to access other people to help them heal themselves. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Andrea asks, hi, Lori and Lynn, question about subconscious and humor. Subconscious is really funny, I'll tell you that. In, in, in P2 Unknown, I got bio and male. So Andrea's studying uh, CRV, and she's, she's uh, already taken the basic course. She says in P2, which she got unknown, and then she got bio and male, and then a stray cat. Jim, my husband, and then I want to lick it. But that clearly came from my subconscious. Now, do I write this down as another stray cat? a note or do I actually go lick the target in a command? It felt totally like a joke and it felt funny. <laughs> Anything you get, you want to write it down. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but this not being a descriptor of the target, you wouldn't write it down on the left side. You go over to the right and you'd say that your response, you know, is that you want to lick it. <laughs> then you could give yourself the, you mentally lick the target and describe taste, temperature, or whatever, and then report what you get. Yeah. As long as as long as you're not doing it in phase one, you might. If you're in phase one, you don't want to do it yet. But once you move into phase two, then you could you could go ahead and go lick things, <laughs> lick to your heart's content in phase two. <laughs> Just don't do it in phase one. Uh, yeah. So yes, Andrea, you would you would list it as a stray cat in phase one. But in phase two, you could actually say, I mentally licked the target and describe. Uh, and depends on what you're also, if you're like on the man-made or the bio or the unknown. And if you're on the unknown and you want to lick it, mentally lick the unknown. Taste. You know, if you have the desire, that's an emotion. So you'd also write that over to the right side as your desire, not something about, not a descriptor of the target. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. You always want to make sure and set those emotions aside. Uh, Chris. The, humor, the humor is there. Listen, uh, and if your subconscious gets just fed up with slowing down for you, <laughs> sometimes it'll pull pranks. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have a story? It sounds like you, there's some stories behind that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had some, we've had some funny pranks. Uh, from the subconscious. Chris Nemack is asking, a lot of people getting into RV, CRV, usually have questions that are esoteric in nature and thus little to no feedback. Is there any balance where people's curiosity of mystery targets can be satisfied, but also focus on targets that have feedback? That's an excellent question. That's a really good question. I like that question. I think I do too, but uh, yeah, your curiosity can, you know, um, you know, I've always said the difference between an excellent remote viewer and a world-class remote viewer is the world-class remote viewer gets curious. You, you just can't stop them from viewing because their curiosity just, you know. And, um, uh, but yeah, the targets you can get feedback on, get curious about them. The targets you can't, get curious about those but you still need to know the methods that keep you from imagining and going off and building castles and, and all this other stuff. So you still need to know how to remote view correctly. And you still have to have that track record that 
the track record shows your dependability on targets where you can't have feedback. It's so true. I, I was standing in Lynn's kitchen one day and uh, Lynn's son was there. Leonard was there. And uh, we, we got into, uh, the, I think it was really the first real conversation we've ever had. And he asked me something about something about esoteric targets. And I went into the whole thing about having a track record and, you know, on, on feedbackable targets. And he goes, wow, you and my dad really are a lot alike. <laughs> I guess he's heard this before. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, uh, Shinta asks, have you guys noticed improvements depending on the environment, the viewer remote views? Oh, yeah, the environment makes a big difference uh, as far as results go. What do you think, Lynn? Uh, you mean the viewing environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we start everybody off saying, get your sanctuary, get your place, you know, and um, learn to remote view there, learn the nitty gritty, learn the rules, develop the habits and all that. But at some point, you also want to say, okay, I'm going to try a session, you know, at work. I'm going to try a session, go down to the cafe, try a session there. At some point, you want to take that sanctuary and say but i can view other places too so uh so yeah uh you develop your ability in a specified place but then once you get the ability and you get the tools and learning break out of that one place and learn to remote view anytime anywhere and that's my advice yeah, I think that versatility is really, really important. And I really emphasize that with my students. So when I first got home from taking my first class with Lynn, I lived in a circus, you know, my, my house was full of children and full of people. And, you know, we had kids climbing the walls and I would start viewing and 10 minutes later, I'd get interrupted and, you know, we want to go to the park or, you know, whatever. And I had to keep interrupting and interrupting. And sometimes I was viewing in the kitchen, sometimes the bedroom, you know, just, I just viewed anywhere and everywhere I could. I was viewing at the park. I was viewing on the street. I was viewing, you know, in the office. And I, I remember crying, calling Lynn and I was practically in tears. And I was like, Albert, who was my husband at the time, I was like, Albert just, he gets to view because of his job. He, he's viewing every day in a, in a nice quiet environment. Every day he gets two hours because his job, he had to wait. He would go places and then have to sit and wait for two hours. So he would always view in the same environment inside his vehicle. Whereas I was having to view in all these different things and I didn't get that little sanctuary. And, uh, and Lynn said, oh, you're going to be really versatile. Don't worry, you'll be really versatile. And then later, once we had an empty nest and I could view in, a, in the same place every time, he goes, now that's going to be the challenge. Can you view in the same place in a quiet environment? <laughs> so um, There's an addendum to that question, by the way. Uh, Ed May talks about uh, Shannon Entropy being a, a factor in your ability to view a target well. Uh, he's almost correct about it. Uh, what we seem to have found is that if the target is a busy, busy, busy place and you're in a busy, busy, busy place, then it's hard to distinguish between the target and where you are. So if you're in a quiet place viewing a busy target, that seems to be easier to view that target. Now, if you're in a quiet place viewing a quiet target, the same problem. So if the target is a quiet library somewhere, go to a cafe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a little story about that. Um, Lynn had given me a target once and it was an actual target. It wasn't like a photo in an envelope type target. And I was sitting in a room with fluorescent lights trying to view and I was like, I'm just not getting anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I didn't know what to do because nothing was coming and that's very unusual. So I got up and I went outside and I sat under a tree and then all of a sudden I just could totally view the target. And it turned out that the target was a, the inside of a warehouse with fluorescent lights, you know, big room with fluorescent lights. And I was in a big room with fluorescent lights. And once I got out of that room and went outdoors under a tree, it made it really easy for me to view that. So I always tell students, 
you know, if you're having trouble viewing something, try changing your environment, go somewhere else. And yeah. that's very different and see if that helps. Ed may um, talk about the um, uh, entropy of the target. The actual fact is it's the difference in entropy of you and entropy of the target. Hmm. Uh, it's just like uh, you stay inside the house too long. You don't notice the temperature. You walk outside, all of a sudden there it is. You stay out there too long. You don't notice the temperature. You walk back in and you notice it. And so we notice differences more than we notice the truth. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. What's the difference between controlled remote viewing and scientific remote viewing? Uh, scientific remote viewing. Um, is that Ed Dames or is that Courtney Brown? I think uh, it's not. I think Ed is, is technical remote viewing. And scientific remote viewing, I think, is Courtney. Courtney? Okay. Yeah. Um, Courtney learned from Ed, and uh, Ed learned from the military. Ed changed his, uh, trying to simplify it to, you know, make it more public. Uh, Courtney learned from him and changed it further, but they're, they're both derivatives of the Ingo Swan method. Uh, now, Courtney's is pretty far from it. Uh, but um, they are derivatives of the Ingus one method. So uh, there is structure to them. Uh, the structure is not the Ingus one structure, but there is structure to them. Yeah. So Valentina, controlled remote viewing was developed by Ingus Swan, and then scientific remote viewing was developed by a student of a student of Ingus. I mean, right. if, if, you, if we were going to just specifically Yep. answer the question. And we don't really know the specific differences because we've never studied scientific remote viewing. <laughs> Do you know, like the telephone game, you know, where you say something, you tell it to somebody else, you tell it to somebody. Uh, it, the uh, thing has, I won't say degraded. I'll say the thing has changed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's changed for sure. Um, do you, do, Diane asked, do you use dreaming to gain information and do you clear your psyche before going to bed? Oh, I don't. Usually by the time I can go to bed, I'm just tired and <laughs> lay down. But uh, uh, in dreaming, uh, I dream basically in short stories. If I would write down my dreams every day, I would be a short story writer that could, you know, publish book after book after book every month or something. Uh, um, so I don't remote view a target while I sleep. I know some people will assign themselves a target, go to bed, and when they get up, they'll see what they got. You know, I don't. No, I don't do that either. But um, I do tend to write down my dreams if I have something that's that I remember that's really clear and and uh, vivid. Um, and I do try to kind of I usually just say a prayer before I go to bed. Jim and I usually pray together. We always pray for Lynn and Linda, and <laughs> and we we always say a prayer before we go to bed and kind of clear things out from the day. But um, I, I write down my inventions that I dream up, and uh, they work by the way. <laughs> that's great. That's cool. Dreaming inventions. Um, let's see. When Ed says when in an ERV state, I see everything in freeze frame, but because Ed, Ed is an advanced viewer, for those who don't know, Ed is an advanced viewer and, and uh, he's on my ops team. And so sometimes we use CRV, sometimes we use ERV, and then sometimes we incorporate ERV into CRV uh, in, a, in the proper structure of doing that. So Ed is asking when he's in the ERV state, he says he tends to see everything in freeze frame, but he's able to move around and look anywhere. Is there ever a movie type of action seen by the viewer? This happens when I go back in time to view an event and I see the event as a sequence of frames. Audio is more telepathic than auditory. Um, yeah, 
I, I see what you're saying, Ed. Um, First of all, let me say um, the ERV that was used in the military no longer exists. Okay. And so um, the, the term ERV is now used for other things, mainly for guided visualization, which is rarely ever freeze frame. Um, it's more like dreams. Um, the um, ERV that he's doing, I'm not sure what it is. I'm surprised he's getting freeze frames. But uh, the thing is, try to remember those frames. Because <laughs> when you, when you quote, wake up from a, an ERV session, you're not writing down details, you're writing down a summary. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, try to remember as much as you can. Those freeze frames are there for a reason. Uh, your subconscious does things for a reason. And uh, pay attention. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I probably couldn't tell you either, Ed. The only the only kind of ERV that I can help you with is the kind that we do together where, you know, where I'm acting as a hypnotist and or the monitor and uh, and you're right there and we can record everything as it's happening, you know, which is which is nice. Um, let's see. <laughs> and then uh, no, uh, Monroe, we, we haven't seen Eastern folks teach how to levitate. Um, OK, what about sessions with the moon? Gosh, I've been tasked with the dark side of the moon so many times mm -hmm. by different people over the last 24 years. How about you, Lynn? How many times have you viewed the moon? Um, I have actually viewed the ship on the moon more often than the facilities on the moon, but they're there. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, uh, I, gosh, I've, yeah. What, um, is the moon an actual moon or is it constructed? That's a good question. Oh, uh, it's an actual moon. So, you know, uh, <laughs> a lot of people say it's a big hollow ball and all that. I think the gravitational pull on the ocean, uh, kind of proves that it's solid. <laughs> yeah. Um, I never really viewed the origin of the moon, for example. That was never a task to me, so I've never looked at it. But I have viewed the dark side, and I viewed the ship that's the, on the moon several times. Um, what are the benefits of RV for the greater good? That's I like that question. Mary says, what are the benefits of RV for the greater good? Oh. Uh, Beginning with, um, first of all, it develops your psychic ability. And uh, in the times to come, that's going to be extremely important for humanity and for survival. Um, second of all, you can help people heal themselves. Uh, you can provide people with the information they need. Uh, you can provide um, people with, you know, the information to rescue missing soldiers, missing kids, uh, abducted children, uh, things like this. Uh, you can work with uh, doctors. Uh, I worked with Dr. Mann at the uh, Cornell Institute uh, to uh, uh, diagnose and help regulate high tension, hypertension, high blood pressures, and uh, and it works. Um, you can find things. You can. Uh, well, let's get down to it. You can go. You can go to Las Vegas and come back with money. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and on a more uh, cosmic level, I guess you could say one yeah. thing. I one thing that that we believe is that. Um, you know, working one heart at a time, one life at a time, we're kind of raising the level of consciousness where people that are learning this, more and more people are learning this, especially since Lynn and I have kind of broadened, you know, instead of just doing like four students at a time, we're now reaching, you know, hundreds of students that are learning this, which is still a drop in the bucket compared to 8 billion people on the planet. But we are reaching so many more people now that you that we're actually i believe raising consciousness because people are suddenly discovering that they have an ability they never realized they had and they're they're actually go realizing what humanity is all about that we are 
far more than just these bodies. We can, we can travel through time and space and get information and go so far beyond. We can connect with other people and understand things. It, it's also really great for understanding. Imagine if you can't get along with someone and you cannot stand their point of view, and then you could actually connect with them on a subconscious level so that you could think the way they think and see exactly why they believe the, what they believe. And, and you know, it just, it's a, it could be a real tool for helping human understanding and resolving issues um, in families and things like that. So I think that there's a, just so, that we could go on for two hours talking about the good that, oh, that it yeah, could do. Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, tell me ask about the, about my abduction experience. And uh, uh, he says, um, they were human looking and muscle builders. I don't know if they were muscle builders or not. I just know they were very muscular in body shape. Um, and um, when they saw you, they seemed very afraid. Have you given any thought as to why? Yeah, I think because I wasn't frozen, um, I was awake. And they, uh, I suspect, that other people being abducted have gotten awake, totally panicked, wrecked things, and you know, and um, they were probably afraid that uh, I was going to do the same. Also, the fact that uh, uh, these guys uh, struck me the gray that was piloting the ship was intelligent. But these guys struck me as, you know, if you said hello, they would be stuck for an answer. Uh, just, you know, not bright at all. <laughs> just, and so uh, I think they were afraid that, you know, uh, there was a human loose in the room. Mm, that makes sense. Anita's asking a good question. She says, um, do you find that groups viewing can, I, I think she's talking about analytic overlay, you know, where, a whole group of viewers can get the wrong information, all get the same information and have it be wrong. We've definitely seen that before. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> definitely seen that. One thing that Mel used to tell me though, is that he felt that analytic overlay is not nearly as frequent as a lot of people think it is, especially if viewers are viewing at different times and different locations. But he said that it was pretty common if you have a whole bunch of viewers viewing in the same room together, for example, or- You mean, uh, or if, you mean telepathic overlay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what that's what Mel used to say. He said, you know, we used to have telepathic overlay if everybody was together sitting at a table remote viewing the same target. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, well, and two, we found that uh, like if I were to tell you as a viewer that this is a very important target and I'm only giving it to you and Joe McMonagle, uh, your respect for Joe at a subconscious level, you will view what Joe views. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, uh, the fact is, Joe makes no bones about this. He misses the target half the time. And I've kept the database. He's true. He's telling the <laughs> truth. And uh, if it's one of those where he misses the target and you're viewing what he views, then you're going to miss it too. Yeah. yeah. So and it, it, There okay. are drawbacks to group viewing. Yeah. Yeah, and there was also a situation, I think it was back during the um, Washington Sniper case, do you remember that? Where uh, there was a group of viewers who were taught by a different trainer, I don't remember who it was, and all the viewers were viewing that there was a red vehicle, and only one viewer, viewer said it was blue, and it was blue, and that was your student, uh, Mike, who had like a 90% accuracy rate in colors, yeah. and he was saying that the car was blue, and he was the only one who was accurate. Matt. And, and and there was this is one of the reasons we keep the database is because we don't just keep your overall scores. The database determines how good you are at colors, shapes, sounds, smells, and so on. And so if a customer comes and wants to know the color of a car, we're not going to pick somebody who has a score of 20% accuracy for that session. We're going to pick the best viewers. And so if you have a hundred viewers and average, their average for the whole hundred is 70%. Mm -hmm. 
but you can pick out the best viewers. You can turn in this uh, information. It's over 90% accurate to any customer by picking and choosing the viewers who are best at what they need to know. Yes, and Jim, yes, there is prerequisite to MedApps. Um, you have to have taken, if I require basic, intermediate, and advanced yes. uh, before I teach MedApps. Um, Lynn, what, what is your prerequisite before MedApps? I highly suggest all three. Um, uh, I will teach somebody who's basic and intermediate. Um, there's nothing in the medical apps course that requires, that absolutely requires CRV. But what you learn by learning CRV is necessary really for doing the medical apps. And so what I found is that people who are psychic um, and have taken the medical apps really have not done well at it. Um, so I suggest at least the basic and intermediate course. I highly suggest the advanced course as well. Um, so I'm glad that you require the advanced course too. Yeah, well, I when the first time I ever took med apps, I came home and was like, oh, my God, this was like the most amazing course ever. And I was flipping out over it. Two years later, I took it again. And it was more mind blowing than the first time I'd taken it. And I asked you and I said, why? Why does it seem like a whole new course? And why is it so much more mind blowing? And you said, well, you're in a different place. You know, you've learned so much more. And so it really, your level of development is really crucial in, in how much you get out of the MedApps class. That's yeah. right. It's not what you learn in CRV. It's how you develop because of CRV that makes you good at it, yeah. Yeah, it's really, really good. And then, um, then M Mandy, I, I'm not sure. I think that, um, Liz, I think Mandy's question is truncated or something. I can't, it's about biolocation, but then the rest of the questions cut off. I'll keep going for now. And then maybe you can tap it in there. Uh, Tammy in Australia says, my stray cats often end up being part of all of my AI and not necessarily close to the target. How can I clear or does it matter? I just realized I need to add that to my data, Lynn. <laughs> your stray cats are being part of your AI. Um, okay, so, and, the, and not necessarily close to the target. Well, AIs, AIs are really about having perceptions that include both you and the target, That's and right. they can often be related. And what um, I think what she might be talking about is every now and then you'll have a, a situation where you have a stray cat, like a man on a horse, but you realize that the man on the horse is up and to your right. And you know, you're seeing the stray cat, but you go, Oh, but it's, I'm also spatially relating to this stray cat. It's not just a stray cat. So I usually tell people when that happens, declare the stray cat man on a horse and then put AI up into my right, right. And then put your emotional reaction to that. Like, oh, I'm curious, you know, I want to find out more about whatever this thing is that I'm perceiving as a man on a horse. One of the things is, like, if it's an AOL, uh, it may be a symbolic AOL. And so whatever a man on a horse represents may be up and to your right at the actual target. Or there may be a man on a horse up and to your right at the actual target. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and so you write it down as an AOL. But then you go back describing the target. And if there's a man on a horse there, it will develop. If not, then what is there will develop. And at the end of the feedback, you'll see how, how it relates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's really good. Lori Mitchell says, my subconscious is definitely a stand-up comedian. <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh, and Sabrina says she'd like to help people find their lost pets. Yes, you can definitely use that. In fact, I have a student. Um, his name is John Stewart. He's a former student of mine. And uh, he has a company called Intuitive Consultants. And his specialty is finding lost pets. And he has a great track record with that. And so I usually refer people to him 
when I have, you know, when people contact me for lost pets, I often refer them to him if I can't take it on right then because of so much we have going on. Uh, oh, Giancarlo's here from Panama. He says, Lynn, I saw you commenting on an interview that years ago you remote viewed the world around 2050 and you saw that it was heavily depopulated. Would you assume that this is going to happen as you saw it or is it only a potential timeline that could change? I really hadn't wanted to get in on, on this, but uh, I found the target and I mean the session and the session said that beginning in the year 2020, uh, there was going to be a series of man-made natural disasters, which would basically last for 20 years. And at the end of the 20 years, um, an estimated 75% of the human population would be wiped out. Uh, I'm fully ready to be wrong on that. And I also know that remote viewers tend to exaggerate disaster, <laughs> <laughs> always. But um, but uh, it's happening, and the things that uh, you know are happening uh, uh, follow exactly what was in that session. And I've been tasked with the future, blind task with the future, several times. Uh, since then, and I keep finding the same. Come to find out, um, Stephen Schwartz and his group back in uh, 85, I think it was, had the same tasking and they basically found the same thing. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, this along with what I found out about the aliens, uh, is is fitting into my global cosmology here but um uh, uh, it's somebody asked me the other day and i said oh they were asking about prepping and i said okay all this prepping of digging a hole you know getting guns and all that uh that's out uh it's it's okay. It's going to be pretty useless. Uh, the uh, the analogy I used was uh, the oxygen masks have dropped. You're a passenger on this plane. Up in the cockpit, the leaders of this plane are arguing about what's wrong and how to fix it and who's going to fly the plane. And in the process, you can't save the plane. The plane's going to crash. Save yourself and the people beside you and just get prepared. And how do you get prepared? Um, not with saving money, but just, um, or, you know, getting weapons and, and learning karate or something like that, but uh, to enhance your life and so on. Um, if the alien agenda does happen, one of the things you need to know, what you need to have is an extremely strong intuitive ability. And, uh, and my opinion is that people who are going around, strutting around saying, I'm psychic and I'm psychic, I'm special and all that. Listen, if they're not teaching others to do it, they're a waste of humanity. Uh, the people who are special in this field are those who are helping others in the field. And, yeah. and Lori, you're one of them. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, thanks to you. <laughs> um, Mandy's asking, uh, could you tell me about bilocating and uses of bilocation? Uh, Ingo Swan discouraged it heavily simply because you bilocate and you come back and you give a summary. And in CRV, we don't want summaries. We want details. <laughs> and uh, if you're sitting there writing things exactly every time a perception comes, you're getting details. Um, the um, And so in formal CRV, bilocation is discouraged. 
I live for it. It is so great. <laughs> Listen, I've had uh, now about 14 experiences of bilocation in, in all these years. Many of the military people have never had one. Wow. Yeah. And uh, some of them have, you know. But, uh, oh, I live for it. It is so fantastic. It really is. Uh, um, yeah, as far as uses of it, um, it depends on who you talk to. Many uses of it. Uh, uh, like I say, you come back and you give a summary. You may learn some stuff and you may have experiences that can even change your own life. But as far as the uh, productive uses of it to help other people, it's uh, it's a great experience. <laughs> I love it. Well, the, I had a I had a bilocation experience once in in which I suddenly found myself in a bar, and I and, and I tell people, I mean, I'm not a bar fly. I've never been much in bars, but I was suddenly bilocating, and I was in this bar, and I could feel the coolness of the bar, and. And I could see like beer signs off to my, you know, like neon beer signs off to my right. And I could see the bartender mm -hmm. and I could hear the clinking of the glasses. But the thing that really got me was a cigarette smoke. Oh, yeah. But the, the thing about it though, was that um, there was a lady next to me and I suddenly just like had this communication with this lady. And that was the whole target was this lady. She was the target. And this woman wanted to make sure that her mother hadn't been murdered. And this woman was her mother. And uh, I, you know, so the bilocation actually did serve to give this girl an answer because I was able to get information from her mother. <laughs> but, um, and her mother was, her mother had been road hard and put up wet and, and her death was not murder. It was because of her own life choices, you know, yeah. so well, lifestyle choices. When, when they had me, you know, view the death ray and step into the death ray to find out some information, about the uh, particle beam, the particles within a particle beam. Um, um, I brought back the information that they needed. For me, the experience of it was one of the most fantastic things I'd ever done. But, um, but yeah, you can get information from it. Um, you just, you come back with a summary, not details. This is why Ingo discouraged it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Jim is asking about protection and clearing of negative entities. Um, I just haven't found negative entities. Um, um, I found negative people at targets. And uh, also, um, I found spirits and negative spirit, you know, non-physical uh, entities at targets. But uh, they were at the targets. Um, uh, it wasn't a thing where where they were trying to get into my brain or anything like that. Now I have had uh, psychic attacks done on me and uh, the people who did that wound up being very sorry for it. But uh, as far as the negative, I just haven't had that experience, you know? Yeah, I haven't either. I haven't run into negative entities through remote viewing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm new to remote viewing and I'd like to know how to remote view or find lost spare keys if I'm totally front loaded and I'm not blind to the target. Okay. You still go for the unknown. Uh, in the military, you know, everybody worries about pollution and all that. Uh, we got training uh, in how to remote view while you're polluted and in fact on the uh, CRV list, uh, if you remember, uh, I did a whole series of highly polluted targets to teach people how to remote view in spite of pollution. And um, the, the rule if you're polluted is always go for the unknown. 
and you know if the uh let's say you go to the police okay and the police say oh we have a criminal who we think you know somebody was murdered and we think the criminal was this and they describe criminal that they think did it and they describe who they think did it and all this and you know if they knew that for sure they wouldn't have called you in <laughs> you know they wouldn't need a remote viewer and so um and so you talk to yourself in the set aside process and you say hey if they knew this for sure, I wouldn't be here. Therefore, this is an unknown, and I'm going to go to the unknown. Okay. And, and so, so, yeah, anytime you have a polluted target, go for the unknown. Yeah. And Janet, really, you you'd probably need to get some training. You know, really learn the structure of CRV, and then we also teach different techniques for ways of kind of blinding yourself to your own targets, especially in the beginning. Because the newer you are at this, the more difficult viewing your own targets can be, unless you're totally blind to the target. Uh, but we do have a lot of different techniques, especially for things like lost keys. Um, and I'll tell you a really quick thing. I, I got to my office one day and there was a woman standing in front of the office and she said, um, I just discovered that you're here. A friend of mine told me about you and I lost some really important keys in my house. Can you help me find them? And I had another appointment like in five minutes. So I said, well, I've got an appointment in five minutes, but here's something really quick I can show you. And I, ha I had her just draw a really quick diagram on a piece of paper of her house. I said, how many stories if it, is it? If it's two stories, use two pieces of paper one for t bottom story, one for top story. But, and I said, and then just, you know, draw the diagram of your house just really quickly. It can even be a box with four squares and then just use a pendulum and say, is it in this part of the house? Yes or no. Is it in that part of the house? Yes or no. And she called me that night and she had found her keys using that technique. Yeah. And it literally took me like two minutes to, to teach her how to do it. That's yeah. a really fast way. If, if, if you've lost the keys to your motorbike uh, and you know, they're in the house, <laughs> that, that's, that yeah, would be the, okay. Yeah. Uh, Dowsing is very good for that. If you go for the remote viewing, uh, people will say, I've lost my keys. Where are they? So they'll try to remote view the keys. No, remote view the surroundings. <laughs> the, the location of the keys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm trying, I'm going to skip over a few right now that I know will take too long to answer because we're running out of time, but, um, uh, oh, Lynn, after all your years of practicing, how close have you become to understanding when something's an AOL and when it's not? Uh, I've gotten pretty accurate about it. Uh, you can control AOLs and you can uh, train to not get AOLs. And so uh, these days, I rarely ever get an AOL. Now, a stray cat is something generally where your subconscious grabs something from either your memory or that messy teenager's room of your of your memory and grabs it and says like this you know or this you know and um and that happens on the subconscious level there's no controlling that all you have to do is on that is learn when something pops in to record it and either move on or else ask yourself, what does that symbolize to me? Or what does that mean to me? And so um, I get a lot of stray cats, but um, I, I just don't get AOLs anymore. I've trained them. I've trained myself out of them. You know, that's oh goodness oh dear all of a sudden it went all the way to the bottom <laughs> i didn't mean for it to but it did it jumped all the way to the last question here um uh let's see have you ever bilocated with anyone else simultaneously uh not not on purpose um there was this one where i bilocated and at the same time a um, Chinese viewer um, or a Chinese psychic spy uh, was looking for us to see what we were doing and uh, we met. 
Uh, so I guess that would be at the same time, you know. Uh, and when she realized that I saw her, she turned around and disappeared. Uh, I think it was Paul Smith who was my monitor at the time. And he said, follow her. And that's how we first contacted the uh, Chinese psychic spy network. Yeah. Um, there is also a question. Steve Johnson asked if we find that computers, televisions, watches, and clocks dysfunction or break when we use them. And the, yes, I, golly, my tech guy is like, I've never seen anybody with as many problems as you have. But then I, I, I think Lynn's had more than I've had, especially after 9-11. Only uh, angry or emotionally upset. Yeah. And after 9-11, I would think I went through uh, 12 computers within that first year, just fried them. And uh, every time I talked to you, you had fried another computer. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, it's like, oh, my God. Finally figured out why. It was because I was there. And uh, um, you mean you were in New York when it happened? I was there and, you know, this guy came out. He was clutching some papers in his chest. He was totally gray. He was just covered with cement dust. And uh, I went to help him. And this cop said, no, train personnel only. And so I turned and didn't help him. And that guilt stayed with me for a year. And I finally figured out, you know, what it was that was causing it, came to terms with it, and that did that, you know. Lynn, um, can, is there anywhere that people can go to look up the alien agenda um, what, that you've referred to a couple of times? Oh, uh, well, Jim Mars has a book out, Alien Agenda, and you can get that on Amazon, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, the alien agenda I was talking about is uh, that paper that I was asked to do where uh, I was to uh, compare and contrast um, evidenced alien psychic ability with human psychic ability. And, uh, and that's where I did that, uh, that in terms of psychic ability, uh, you could divide it into four groups. One was aliens who are more psychic than we are and don't like us. Uh, aliens who are friendly to us and do like us and more psychic than us. And unfriendly ones who are not psychic or less psychic than we are and friendly ones who are less psychic than we are. And uh, uh, the friendly unpsychic ones are here for trade the unfriendly unpsychic ones tend to not come here the um, friendly very psychic ones want to help us develop our ability the unfriendly psychic ones just want us dead and uh, i couldn't figure out what their what their agenda was and their agenda is simply that we are going into space and uh, uh, the, the one incident that um, told me what the agenda was and why uh, was an incident where there was an abduction. Um, the ship came right up over the people, froze them, and they were abducted. And they saw the ship a long way away, you know. And uh, it dawned on me that the that the aliens who did that had much more psychic ability than humans have, but no range. And one of the things we learned in remote viewing in CRV is that we're weak in psychic ability, but we can see across space and time like we can see across a room. Mm -hmm. When we get into space, if we develop our intuitive abilities we will be a major power in the universe that's why our friends want us to develop it our enemies don't want us out there 
Yeah, that's that's a, um, yeah, that's a that's a good one. I was. Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on the coming COVID nineteen vaccination? Uh, thoughts? Yeah, nothing from a re remote viewing. I really believe they're going to put nanoparticles into our bodies, and you know, to control our brains and all that. However, uh, I have heard. I'm not sure if this is true. That one of the elements in the uh, in at least several of the vaccinations being developed is aluminum. And aluminum in your system will cause uh, uh, brain damage. It will cause Alzheimer's. It will cause uh, all kinds of mental problems in your brain. And if the vaccination has aluminum in it, I don't want it. So I'm not worried about nanoparticles controlling my brain and for the government, you know. Um, but I don't want aluminum in my system. Um, Loon, is it easy to find missing people with CRV? I'm sorry? Is it easy to find missing people with CRV? Uh, yes. If you're if you're trained and you stick with the with the methodology, uh, now, and also if you get details, uh, many psychics will say, you know, oh, the missing person is wearing blue jeans and I see him in among trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have, yeah, you have to get enough detail so that police can, can yeah. tell the difference. Yeah. Um, uh, one that, um, one that I did for Spotsylvania police, uh, I, I found that there was a curve in the highway. There was a dirt road going off to the side and about a hundred yards from the highway, there was a fence with a red rag hanging on it and a body would be found under a pile of leaves. Um, the next day, in fact, after I recorded that, there was a cop there who came up to this corner and noticed a road going out, a dirt road going off to the side. He'd heard about that, so he went out. He found a red rag and there was a body. They had piled it with leaves and tried to set the leaves on fire, but the leaves were wet and wouldn't burn and they found the body underneath it. Yeah. Okay, so that's, yeah, the spe specificity really helps because every town has libraries and banks and grocery stores and, you know, that kind of thing. So you really have to, yeah. to get, do you find that, uh, the Sylvia is asking, do you find that doing ideograms with your non-dominant hand is helpful or encouraged? I don't, I haven't found it to make any difference, but then I'm, I'm ambidextrous. Um, I had asked Paul Smith, he's left-handed. And um, he said he didn't really see any difference. Uh, I've asked other people like uh, Bill Ray, who's right-handed. He said he really didn't see any difference. Um, so I think consensus opinion is whatever works, whatever works for you, whatever you learn to do, just do it, you know. And Wanda, when we teach medical applications, we don't have a specific target pool because it's not like pictures and envelopes. Um, we have people that request healing that we try, you know, that we work on, that we help in med apps, just to answer that question quickly. Yeah, and along that line, when I teach medical apps, the, uh, the second third of the uh, course is uh, uh, diagnostics. You want to diagnose. You want to diagnose what's really wrong with the person, so you're not healing the wrong thing, or trying to heal the wrong thing. And uh, so we take proven medical cases, and uh, and train the people how to diagnose. Then in the third part, we teach them how to access people and help those people heal themselves we don't try to heal them yeah it's like it's like um 
it's like a, a persuasion. It's a type of psychic persuasion in a way. That's right. If the person needs that sickness and you heal them, they're going to get sicker with something else. So you have to diagnose what's really wrong. And um, um, also, um, if you heal them, they can get sick again. And then you have to do it again. If you teach them how to heal themselves, it will be permanent. And, and also, they learn how to heal themselves with other problems too. So, you know, never try to heal them. Teach them how to heal. I think that's, yeah, that's a wonderful answer. Um, someone asked about stray cats. The difference between an AOL and a stray cat is an AOL comes from the conscious mind. It's usually a noun that comes from the conscious mind or a thought about what the target is. Uh, if it's red, brown, and rubbery, therefore it must be a ball versus, uh, versus something that bubbles up from the subconscious. Like, oh, I suddenly remember playing ball with my dad in the driveway. I bet this target is a ball game. So it could be a memory, a fear, a desire, things like that. So stray cats are bubbling up from the subconscious. AOLs are coming from the conscious mind. That's just a quick explanation for someone who is coming in from zero and just asking what a stray cat is. Yeah, and stray is, sub, is an acronym, the subconscious transfer of recollections, anxieties, and yearnings, memories, fears, and desires to cat consciously accessible thought yeah mm -hmm. someone cool. asked if you have you ever tried viewing in a certain uh geometric structure like like in a pyramid or or anything like that lynn um and see if it affected your accuracy i never have well the building was rectangular i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah the buildings many shapes of buildings but i've never noticed that the shape had anything to do with anything um uh let's see um, people, several people have asked about past lives, um, you know, whether, and, and I personally don't use CRV that way. I, what about you, Lynn? I mean, to view past lives and that sort of thing. Before I was brought into the remote viewing unit, uh, General Sobobon sent me to the, uh, Monroe Institute and that's what they do. And, um, uh, I experienced past lives, uh, whether that was suggestible by the process that they teach at the Monroe Institute or real, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and I've experienced past lives because I was a therapist for 14 years, yeah. uh, but I've never used remote viewing to look at past lives. No. no. Um, I past oh. lives real because that means maybe there's future lives too. <laughs> um, Larice asks, have you, either of you experienced hearing and understanding conversations at the target? And is there a remote viewing etiquette when it comes to viewing others without their permission? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. For the conversations, uh, uh, listening in on conversations and uh, the etiquette for CRV is who the target if you don't have permission, view the target. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Russians, the Russian high command is not going to give you permission to listen in on their conversations. <laughs> view the target. Uh, that's a good soldier answer. That's a soldier <laughs> answer, yeah. Um, also, the criminal who's got something planned for a bank robbery He's not going to give you permission to listen in on the plans if you're the target, you know. Uh, but along that same line, uh, when you learn CRV and you learn to get information, a question of ethics comes up. And ethics becomes very important. Uh, why are you viewing that other person and listening to their conversation and uh, and so on? Um, so I I am very strong on developing good ethical viewing as well as good viewing. Um, I think it's very important. 
it really is. Yeah, I think so too. And one thing I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you're at the well, It's really important. And when I first met Lynn, one of the reasons I really wanted to learn from Lynn was because I sensed from him a much stronger sense of ethics than I sensed from any other teacher that I checked out. And so I really wanted to learn from him because I also really feel like I have a strong sense of ethics and I wanted to, to learn with Lynn. So um, that's something I've always, mm -hmm. I've always been really keen on and, and, and something that Lynn definitely has always emphasized. Um, Pilar has asked, I would like to know why you think the military allowed anyone to learn CRV. They didn't just allow it. They, they mandated it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the reason was, um, well, the military didn't, okay? Uh, the military got stuck with us. Uh, the intelligence community mandated. Uh, mm. They did because um, 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 I forget his first name. Anyway, Pinkowski uh, uh, defected from, tried to defect from Russia didn't make it alive, but he tried to defect. And uh, in the process, we got the documents that showed that the Russians had a psychic spying effort that worked and they were getting our secrets. And so the intelligence, you know, everybody laughed at that, but the intelligence community doesn't tend to laugh. <laughs> uh, they said it works, then we've got to have it too. And, uh, and so um, that's why it was mandated. Yeah. Very good. Well, I think we've done pretty good at answering a lot of these questions. Um, uh, I, the last question, Ida asks, how is RV useful for informed decision making? Um, the intelligence community has a, uh, uh, has a motto. And that is knowledge is power. Okay. Uh, your decision making. What if you could go through life never making a bad decision? Uh, would totally change your life. And the remote viewing can help you along that line. Uh, as you learn remote viewing, you learn that you can uh, make remote viewing a two way street in that conversation, you know, mm -hmm. you can access your past self at the moment of making a decision and pass hindsight back in order to help that decision be a good one uh, with hindsight. And uh, you can go through life really cutting your bad decisions down to almost zero. And that's going to change your life. Yeah. That's right. And uh, yes, and you did, you do talk about that in your book. Uh, people, you know, like. Oops. Uh, we lost Lori. Uh oh. Did I lose? I, I suddenly lost, lost everything. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just suddenly, I don't know what happened. I did something. I'm tech. Isn't my thing. Um, anyway. Okay. So somebody's asking, several people have been asking about live classes versus uh, recorded classes. And I just want to say Lynn and I both have six week recorded video classes that you can watch at your leisure. You can, you know, you, regardless of your schedule, um, I'm still teaching live. I'm teaching a live basic class in December. Um, and it's actually both online and in person. We'll see how things are going then because we did have to cancel the in-person portion back in July when we tried to have an in-person class. Um, but this one, we do have some people coming in person. And then um, we uh, also, somebody's asking about like, well, if you're taking like an online class and you have questions, what do you do? I think we both have forums and live webinars that we offer as part of that. And, um, and for uh, Valentina, it, we are in ours, it's two free months when you can sign up whenever you want to for those two free months. So, uh, and, you know, and so then once you start the two free months, you're just, you can ask all the questions you want. Um, and, 
And then after that, we have a club that offers all kinds of benefits. And then Lynn, you also have a live thing, a webinar thing that you do twice yeah. a week. Uh, my online course is um, a little over 160 videos for the basic course. I've got more to add. Um, also, I have two webinars a week, one for the other side of the world and one for this side of the world to make it, you know, at the right time. I am firmly convinced that you cannot learn CRV effectively unless you have person to person time with a trainer. And yeah. uh, so uh, uh, twice a week we have uh, webinars and many of the people uh, will be up at two and three in the morning in order to get the to the webinar as well that's for china australia and all that and many of the people on that side of the world stay up at god awful hours you know in order to make both uh both uh sessions and uh and we have permanent access to the videos and the webinars we don't put a two-month limit on it uh, so, uh, uh, you know, once you sign up for the course, you have permanent access to the webinars and to all the videos for review, for asking questions, getting answers and all that. Uh, and, uh, so as the webinars, as long as I'm above ground <laughs> and capable, you know, uh, they will be there. So. Yeah, I always tell people you have forever access, but forever means uh, as long as the internet lasts or until I die or until you die or, you know, <laughs> that's what forever means. <laughs> and, and forever as much as is within our power <laughs> or, or, or until Jesus comes back. I, I always say that too. <laughs> people always go, oh, yeah, until Jesus comes back. Um, anyways. Because if I reincarnate, I'm going to have to take the course again. You know? I know. I told Jim it'd be my luck, you know, to... To, to die and then immediately be waking up in a new baby as a baby being born going, oh, no, I'm back. I didn't even get two minutes. <laughs> I'm back already. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, oh, thanks, Ronald. Sorry, I'm not very – I thought I was replying. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> yes. Okay. I don't even remember what they are. Send them to me and I'll, I'll forward them. Okay, so, um, yes. So our website – uh, Lynn's website is crviewer.com and you can go on there and explore. He's got free resources. He's got the classes on there. All the information you need is there. My website is intuitivespecialists.com and I'll, we have, you know, the calendar. The, both of us have calendars on our websites. I have a free four-part remote viewing course that you can take if you're just like, I don't even know if I'm going to like this. I don't want to buy a course if I don't know if I'm going to like it. The whole purpose of the free course is just to see if this is something you would enjoy, but it actually teaches you to do a basic remote viewing session and it's completely free. So you can find that on there. Pardon me. You have over 500 people signed up for it this time too. Yeah. There's a, oh really? How do you find, even find that? I didn't even know. Anyway. She's on the bottom of the screen. Oh, <laughs> that's the thing the web guy does, I guess. Anyway, so yeah, so you can sign up for the free course anytime, you know, and just take that. And that way you can get a feel for if this, if CRV, because not that CRV isn't for everybody. Some people just, you know, like, oh, that's too much structure for me. But, uh, but if you're the kind of person that has an analytical mind or has a good balance between right and left brain functions, and you like the scientific proven way of, of accessing that part of you, that uh, knowing part of you, that psychic side, then it's, it's a great way to find out um, to see if, if it's something that is for you. Uh, thanks, Janice. Janice says, you both give so much to the world. Thank you for being you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, uh, oh, and somebody asked if, if the MedApps class, Nicole asked if she said she took a medical intuitive class once and asked, is it the same thing? No, it's very different. Every single class I've taught, 
I've had students like Deborah Katz who took med apps and said, I've taken like five medical intuitive classes and five healing classes. And this is so different from anything I've ever taken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thanks Ron for forwarding those. Cause I was like, I have no idea. Um, anyway, that was the one that I answered to, um, to Nicole Pierce who asked if it was different. And then also Trinity, um, my website is just, um, I mean, my email, if you wanted to ask that question is Lori at intuitive specialist.com. If you just wanted to write to me. Uh, thank you so much, Ron, for doing that. I appreciate that. Okay, guys, thanks so much. We're going to go ahead and uh, move on right now, just because um, we don't want to wear everybody out and we want to make these short enough that we can put the replay on without them being really memory laden. But we are going to do these as often as we can. I saw one go by. The disasters will not take out the internet. It will wind up to where our relationships with each other are going to be all electronic and we will be divided uh, among people. Anyway. Um, yes. And Kristen, yeah, if um, for med apps, I require basic, intermediate, and advanced. And Lynn, Lynn requires at least basic and intermediate. Thanks, guys. We're going to go ahead and end the meeting now, but we'll be back, won't we, Lynn? If we, we're willing and the crick don't rise. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye. Bye.